Well, that is certainly a cheerful reading from the Hebrew Bible, isn't it? Wow. So I have to tell you that this is the fourth sermon I've written uh, in the last, what, 36 hours. I thought about not doing a sermon at all today, which might have been a good plan. Some of you know me well, but some of you don't know me quite as well. My husband would tell you, that when I am really angry, I cry. So if you're ever in a church meeting with me and I start to cry, you might want to duck for cover. (laughs) I am going to preach this morning, and I hope that you will listen with your hearts and with your minds. We are beginning today this series on everyday justice. We're stopping in the midst of this summer and taking some time to understand that the choices we make each day have a global impact. From the coffee we drink, to the clothes that we wear, to the car that we drive, to the chocolate that we eat, all these choices are filled with aspects of relationships that are not apparent. The idea of everyday justice comes from a book that my friend Julie Claussen wrote a few years ago. She begins her book with two words from one of my favorite old movies, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. No judging. The two words are, don't panic. She did this because all too often when we begin thinking about changing our lifestyles, we quickly become overwhelmed by the problems that exist. It's hard to know these days what justice issue we should focus on. Especially today, we ask, should we focus on gun violence and white supremacy, or on immigration, refugees, and children locked in cages? Should we focus on race and power and police brutality, or homelessness, hunger, and despair, or the climate crisis that threatens to make all of these a mute point? As people and as a church who care about what is happening in the world, it's hard to know which one of these crises we should respond to first. The sheer magnitude of the problems every day all around us are paralyzing. Yet we are tired of not making a difference. When we feel paralyzed or overwhelmed, we see acting justly as an all or nothing endeavor. We throw up our hands and say, I can't change all of this. So we end up doing nothing. For too long, most of us have lived compartmentalized lives, lives that don't allow us to see how connected everything in our world truly is. Encountering justice issues over the next month might change the way we see things. It might help us understand that our lives are part of the bigger picture and that our local, everyday choices reverberate around the world. Now, I want to warn you, this month will probably make your life more complicated. Each one of us will begin to realize that acting justly means becoming more aware of the problems in the world. It will probably also affect where we shop, how we dress, how we drive, and how well we are able to sleep at night. It may mean that we will begin to see all of our choices as ethical choices. But remember Julie said, don't panic. To be clear, For us, justice is not political, it is biblical. It is hard to read the scriptures, both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, without coming across narrative after narrative that speaks to the injustice in the historical context of those times and places. We are, of course, finding these days that there is nothing new under the sun. That wonderful scripture reading this morning brings back a couple of characters from our Lenten series, Jezebel and Ahab, both of them poster children for how not to run a country. Their self-centeredness, their narcissism, and their belief that everything was theirs for the taking 
was more corrupt than we can imagine, perhaps. Someone could certainly have said to them, have you no decency? Do you know that that's the line that some brave senator finally said to Joseph McCarthy? Sir, have you no decency? You may not know that Joe McCarthy stood right here in this pulpit. We know of at least one time, maybe more. Not something we're overly proud of in our history. If Jezebel and Ahab had been asked that question, they probably would not have been given the correct answer. It doesn't matter because the words of the prophet still resound every time that question is asked in history or in our present life. I find myself these days shaken to the core by the news cycle. Most of the time I refuse to listen or to read what happened on any given day, which is why I didn't know anything about the massacre in El Paso until late last night. And I learned of the massacre in Dayton, Ohio from a comment on our Facebook page this morning. Each and every day our cups overflow with bad news. Which is why on Sunday mornings when we come into this sacred space, we need to have the opportunity to catch our breath, to sing our sorrows, to listen and let our minds and hearts be filled with hope. We must find in this time ways to leave this place ready to be just people in our everyday lives. We must help each other find a path, a path of justice and goodness that will help change our world. To change the world, we have to start somewhere. So this morning, we begin thinking about our relationship to the creation and all its inhabitants. Most of us, on a deep level, do love creation. And we do love the inhabitants of this world. We love this place we call home. But we are not all on the same page with regards to one of our most pressing problems. No matter what you believe about climate crisis, it becomes harder every day not to recognize what is happening to our earth that is changing so rapidly. Some people in our world, quite truthfully, have decided they don't care. Rather like Ahab and Jezebel, actually. Because those two were going to take that vineyard and drive it into the ground simply because they could. We hear this reflected when people exhibit that, come hell or high water, I'm going to get that oil and that gas out of the ground no matter what it may cost in the future. They're going to make all the money they can and let the little people worry about the results because after all, they believe it will not affect them personally. Others have given up hope and they're working on finding ways for us to live on the uninhabitable earth that will be our reality in life after warming. One writer declares that he no longer believes that the crisis is happening slowly. He doesn't think any of us do. He no longer believes that it's happening only far away, that it's primarily about sea level rise, that wealth can defend against it, or that we can expect an easy technological fix. No, he says we're headed for an abyss and we are incapable of stopping the global platychism that we have unleashed. Yet somewhere in the middle, are people who each and every day are working for change. You may know a few of these people. These are the people who no longer use single-use plastics. These are the people who have simplified their lives so that they are not taking and using more 
than their fair share of water and electricity. These are the people who are teaching their children and their grandchildren that we are all responsible for the earth. These are the people who keep planting trees, believing that maybe, maybe we can turn the tide. These are the people who only drive energy efficient cars because they worry about their carbon imprint. And these are the people who only make right turns when driving as much as possible. Seriously, right turns only. Several years ago, the shipping giant UPS decided to stop making left-hand turns. Sitting in an idle vehicle to make a left-hand turn wastes gas. So in the routes their drivers take, left turns are few and far between. In 2017, their estimates show they saved 100 million gallons of fuel, which reduced their carbon imprint by 100,000 metric tons, which is equivalent to taking 21,000 cars off the road. And it added only six to eight miles per driver per route, per day. My friend Bob Hill has been doing this crazy right turn thing for years, and in the beginning, it drove me crazy. But Bob is one of those people who has never met a grassroots effort he couldn't support, no matter how silly or unrealistic it was. He is an example of a white male who has used his privilege for good as often as he possibly could. Even though he is from Texas, he lived in California for a few formative years, which I think must have made all the difference. <laughs> Living in California, we are acutely aware of injustice in all its forms. I give thanks on a daily basis that this is where I live now. Many of us have become very aware of what is happening to our oceans. Sharon Lawrence is here. Heal the Bay is her cause. We are very aware of what is happening and that the lives that live in and under that beautiful blue water that we love are in danger. Last year, seeing videos and pictures of turtles with straws in their nostrils made a huge impact on how we all looked at the tremendous problem of our discarded plastics in the oceans. I admit I am one of the worst offenders with straws. I drink everything with straws. I immediately felt guilty, so I ordered some packages of paper straws, thinking that I was doing the right thing, but it turns out, first of all, they were really horrible straws, and they were made in a country with labor that was not paid a fair wage. So I took the cup of buying, I took the step of buying cups with built-in straws, which has helped. Granted, they are plastic, but I use them over and over. And yet I still feel guilty. But I always remember my mother saying, a little healthy guilt never hurt anyone. See, I need to feel guilty because there is absolutely no reason for me to continue using plastic straws. No reason. So I'm hoping in these next weeks, few weeks, you will help to assuage my guilt by joining me in the no plastic straw grassroots movement. I'm gonna see if my friend Bob will come help us. So. <laughs> Today, we have a, an everyday justice gift for you. After worship, we invite you during coffee hour to take one of the metal straws home with you. I hope you will use these metal straws in the days to come. And I hope it will be a reminder to you that every choice we make helps turn the tide from injustice to everyday justice. 
May it be so. Amen.